Let's open this video with a semi-pretentious soliloquy, where I try to explain my relationship with this franchise, seeing how this is my first video on it and I never covered the first game. Skip to this time code if you're here to only hear my thoughts about The Last of Us Part 2, but know that I will be talking about the game with the notion that you, the viewer, are aware of the first game. So, in the summer of 2013, when The Last of Us video game first came out, I was in the middle of studying for my first post-high school degree and still living at home when my parents got a divorce. I am not 100% sure at what point I finished it for the first time, but during that summer it was a welcome distraction for me while I was stressing out on which one of my parents to stay with. So I played through the game multiple times, even discussing the story of the game with other people and how it could work as a television series. You can so imagine how it was for me when the HBO Max show was announced and I watched the first season weekly as the episodes were coming out. The story of the first game and the show was about a post-apocalyptic North America 20 years after an outbreak of a real-life Cordyceps virus mutated to also affect humans and... Basically it was like Children of Men, where an older man already dead inside was given a mission to escort a young girl on a long journey from point A to point B, and then to point C before the climax eventually happened at point D. The point where The Last of Us ended was on an ambiguous cliffhanger that the game had built itself towards through on its year-long story, where the older man and the young girl had developed a parent and childlike bond between each other. With that bond having revived the older man's will to live, and then caused him to do something that left the players hanging on a bittersweet ending. And I'm just going to drop all the pretenses here to state out that by the evidence presented in the first game, Joel did the right thing. With some two extreme methods, I must admit, but still the right thing. The HBO Max show may have rewritten the scenes with altered dialogue to make the fireflies look like they knew what they were doing. Our doctor. He thinks that the cordyceps in Ellie has grown with her since birth. Why is she in surgery? It produces a kind of chemical messenger. It makes normal cordyceps think that she's cordyceps. It's why she's immune. He's going to remove it from her, multiply the cells in a lab, produce those chemical messengers, and then we can give it to everyone. He thinks it could be a cure, Joel. A cure. Cordyceps grows inside the brain. It does. Find someone else. But by the first impressions given by the original 2013 PlayStation 3 version, the Fireflies were a bunch of wannabe revolutionaries rebelling against the established government for the sake of having something meaningful to do, and we only had their word that they could have made a cure to the Cordyceps virus by killing Ellie to learn why she is immune to it. Their word in which Marlene promised to pay Joel and Tess with their guns if they delivered Ellie to the Fireflies. And when Joel did that, he was beaten up and almost escorted into the outside world without his equipment and told to consider it as a gift that he is not paid for the job he was hired to do and did. Again, it was fixed on the HBO Max show. Walking onto the highway, leave him there with his pack. Give him this. But if this was something you had to rewrite to fix after the fact, then what stopped you from doing it like that the first time? Now, seven years later after The Last of Us came out, we got a sequel unoriginally named as The Last of Us Part 2 in 2020, and I never bought it for myself back then. Mostly because of the leaks on the game's plot, and the director Neil Druckmann's handling of the situation, as well as doubling down on the criticisms the game was given. Granted, whatever creative criticism there might have been was buried under hot takes and hate posts. But those latter examples are usually the ones you should ignore in favor of the former when you are a creative. Anyway, one of my friends ended up buying the game, and by the time when the HBO Max show had come and gone, I had finally figured out how to use an Elgato HD60S Plus capture card. 
So, when we were talking about the HBO Max show's inevitably upcoming season 2, I asked if he was open to letting me borrow his copy so I could stream myself playing The Last of Us Part 2 for the first time, and then make this review once I was finished with it. And to those people who decided to skip the opening, now let's talk about the video game. Tina, can you please shoot them? You seem to have more ammunition than I do. Please! I run around, you do the... Oh yes! Fucking... And now I have no more ammunition for any weapon. Skip to this time call for the story discussion. Let's get the obvious part out of the way first. On a technical level, this was one of the best games I have ever gotten the opportunity to play, and by the end of my first gameplay stream I was still trying to convince myself to keep playing it. Relatively early on, there is a something close to an open world section with a map showing different locations to go to, and without knowing if I might not be able to come back here, I of course went through all of them while also discovering this uncharted easter egg. Hold on. Sick Parvis. Is this an uncharted reference? Sir Francis Drake's ring! Later on in the game there were also notes and letters that doubled as both treasure maps leading to caches of resources, but also worked as environmental storytelling tools painting a better picture on what kind of people used to live in these abandoned building apartments we were traveling through. The graphics were also unbelievably well created in making the game look as realistically animated as possible, so much that it was not far from sometimes coming across as live action. For example, when picking up and looking at collectibles, the close-ups of the hands holding them look unbelievably detailed. I can see where all those crunch work hours were put into. The exploration in the game is then after that open world pretty much reduced into linear corridors where you need to get from point A to point B, then to point C and finally to point D. There are not many alternative routes that lead to Rome, but I suppose that was done so that players won't get lost without a waypoint telling us where we are supposed to be going. Then when it comes to the enemy encounters, they are once again divided into the human enemies and to the infected enemy types. In both cases I always wanted to use stealth as much as possible, sometimes by hiding in the tall grass like a wild Pokemon, because eventually when I got discovered it always turned into a resource waste where I always ended up with less bullets in my guns to defend myself with. Also, regular bow is superior compared to the crossbow. In stealth situations, it was faster to kill human enemies by one-shotting them with the regular bow, whereas the crossbow always needed to be fired twice, which naturally ended up causing me to be found and so stealth turned into combat. The infected enemy types on the other hand were easy pickings by one-shotting them with the bow. And the infected enemies in general were what I sometimes enjoyed to confront in stealth situations, mostly when it was just the regular infected and clickers. But this game then decided to introduce new versions of the bloater called samblers that can do AoE damage, and stalkers from Dead Space 2. Especially when those two are traveling in groups, then you are forced to fight them. However, when taking away the stealth and going into forced combat situation, that is where I was introduced to the game's seriously poor checkpoint system. In that early game open is world section, there was a point where I had to find gas from the parking garage of a ruined courthouse, so I could open a gate to move forward in the story. It was an area where I had to enter through the elevator shaft and the checkpoint kicked in once I entered the parking garage and the enemy started attacking. Meaning that every time I died down there, I had to start over from the exact same spot where shit had already hit the fan, and I was forced to run around busy reloading my weapons, crafting health packs to heal myself, and looking for ammo while avoiding the infected enemies. And it was just ammo as there were no melee weapons to prevent making the close combat be a death sentence. A more ideal checkpoint for this situation would have been to put it before entering the elevator, so I could get my bearings together and prepare for the ambush better with loaded weapons, better health, and not be this close to rage quitting. 
I played the game on normal difficulty by the way, as I see it as the default difficulty on how games are meant to be played. Not too easily so it becomes boring, and not too hard so I end up getting stuck. And another similar situation then came later into the second half of the game, where after helping two of my AI partners through a window so they could open a door, the location I was in was then swarmed by the infected, which included both clickers and those samblers. And again, the checkpoint activates once the infected began to run at me. A more ideal checkpoint would have been to put it before I helped my AI partners out and activated the event. There were also certain points in the game's narrative where I was expected to make the player characters to do something with a button prompt, and in my opinion it would have been better to offer us as the player a choice to do some of those button prompts in a different way that would have led to the same outcome. For example, at one point there is a chase sequence that ends with us as Ellie catching her prey in a cordyceps infected area, where her target is already infected and would die eventually to the infection. When our target then refuses to give out information that Ellie wants, the game makes the player start a beating on our victim with a blunt object on a button prompt. And in my opinion, this could have been a chance for a more creative way by instead having Ellie just sit there and watch, as her target is slowly taken by the infection and begs to be let out of her misery in exchange for what Ellie wants to know. Here I want to remind you all that video games are an interactive media, and so when the game is presenting us with an option to do something in another way, it should not force us to do it in just one way, just because the game demands it. No, I am not talking about that yet, it's something else. During one of the stealth sections where I was supposed to get from the beginning of one area to the end, with it being filled with human enemies, I was actually able to get around all of them without getting caught or being forced to fight them to the death. But when I was trying to open the door leading out of it and into the next area, opening the damn door took so much time that of course I was noticed and forced to defend myself by killing everyone. Remember how Deus Ex Human Revolution came out in 2011, and it had an achievement slash trophy for finishing it without killing anyone outside of the bosses? I never asked for this. On another comparative note, during the last few years The Last of Us Part 2 has also been compared to Spec Ops The Line, which I should probably stream through at some point in the future, and in multiple cases the human enemies when killed get called out by their comrades by name, which I assume was to make us feel bad for killing them in the first place. Except that the game forces us to kill human enemies and NPC characters in cutscene without any alternative methods to deal with them. Here comes my second comparison to another video game Dishonored, where we play as an actual assassin and the amount of people we kill in that game is tied to a morality system that will determine which one of the three endings we get for that game. Bravo! I knew you'd come. Is it going to be okay now? Will I be Empress? The others are all dead, aren't they? That's alright, because I was going to have them killed anyway. Except that The Last of Us Part 2 has only one ending, and it is biased as PERKELE. More about that when I start to talk about the story campaign, but I feel like the mandatory kill should have been regulated to the infected enemies, and the actual combat situations where we are supposed to be defending ourselves. That way, if you have a chance not to kill anyone in stealth sections, and if you are able to get through them without killing anyone, that could spare the player character's mental state from decaying as much as the story needed it to crumble by the end. I'm sure most people here know what I'm talking about, so let's wrap up the gameplay section first by talking about the boss encounters. Later into the game there is a point where we go into a hospital that was a ground zero for the initial Cordyceps virus and had a lot of infected people piled up in there. 
Discounting the fact that these infected are not undead zombies, but rather they are still living bodies controlled by a brain infection, and living bodies need nourishment to stay alive. So what was keeping these clickers and this rat king from dying away without food, other than that the story demanded it? So, the rat king fight. It was somewhat intense to fight against a new form of the infected as an amalgamation of multiple infected enemies. And it is best to be fought from a distance because close combat is suicidal. Essentially, shoot at it with everything you have while running around the area like a headless chicken. Eventually it enters a second stage by having stalkers and or clickers come out of it as extra distractions, and it also has a checkpoint here because this second stage required a lot of trial and error to avoid, and kill those stalkers slash clickers before focusing on the rat king again. Eventually it dies rather anticlimactically after being shot at enough times. What? I don't know what to say. This felt so intense. And then up, up, then it just... As a horror game boss, it works without the health bar telling you how much longer you need to keep standing your ground against it. But as a video game boss itself, the Rat King ended up coming across as rather flat and out of place. Especially when the infected enemies seem to just be there as plot devices and obstacles, while the game's story was not focused on them as much as the first game was. Then there are other boss-like sequences later after that, when fighting such a durable human enemy in a burning island town, that really made you take the L1 dodging mechanic added into this game seriously in dodging that boss's attacks and hit back when he was out of breath between swings. And even then the method of how we had to finish him off made me go all, how is this man not dead yet? As for that other similar human boss where you need to know when to dodge and when to attack, that is the final boss of the game, and for that I think it's for the best that I start to talk about the story already. Oh, hard to okay, so. The story got leaked out months before the release back in 2020, and even without it being spoiled, I'm sure a lot of people were guessing that Joel would die in this game, because of his age not making him strong and durable enough to survive in this world anymore. So his death was all but inevitable. However, the circumstances of where, how and why it happens should have been handled much better, and also probably with a couple of more rewrites to it. And that is not even the first thing to criticize here, as unlike with the first game and a lot of other video game sequels, the story of The Last of Us Part 2 is told non-linearly with flashbacks, with some of them almost turning the game into not just a sequel to The Last of Us, but also into a sequel to some other story. The story is essentially divided into two separate and paralleling campaigns with two playable characters, a four years older version of Ellie from the first game and the new character Abby. Now, I recognize Abby being created as the consequences for Joel's actions at the end of the first game, but as the game then moved on forward from there, Abby started to come out more as a creator's pet who is justified with everything she does. And the non-linear storytelling of the game is also not doing any favors to Abby's characterization, when her establishing character moment is made to be her killing Joel after a couple of gameplay sections as her, with the only context of it being that she is an ungrateful brute who violently with her friends encouraging and helping her murdered the man who saved her life more than once in that same in-game hour. After that, the game makes us play as Ellie in hunting Abby and her friends down in Seattle, before the game then jumps into Abby's campaign in halting the narrative at the second act climax. 
It is only here where we are meant to learn Abby's side of the story, her motivations for killing Joel, and what non ellie related side activities she was doing during Ellie's story campaign. And this is all done for what I can recognize as shock valued plot twist, something that I already criticized for in my Gotham by Gaslight video, and it could have been done with more emotional tension in it if Neil Druckmann and his co writer Halle Gross would have tried to be more like Alfred Hitchcock rather than like M. Night Shyamalan. By that I mean they shouldn't have made it be a huge twist that Joel was killed by the daughter of the head doctor he killed at the end of the first game as Ellie can only watch helplessly, but rather by revealing it in the building up towards Abby's confrontation with Joel with escalating tension. Instead, Neil Druckmann has stated that he made the story be like this because he wanted the players to hate Abby at first and then learn to empathize with her later into the game. I would like to say that is an ambiguous goal, except that Yoko Taro beat Neil Druckmann to the punch with that premise by a full decade with Nier Replicant in 2010, and then again by three years with Nier Automata in 2017. I cannot speak much about Replicant, as I'm still in the middle of my four-part review series on that game, but with Automata, the premise of a character A being killed by character C, while character B witnesses it to hunt down character C, who then grows from that experience, was already done with 2B as Joel, 9S as Ellie, and A2 as Abby. For those of you who have not played Nier Automata, or watched the three videos I made reviewing it in 2022, that game is also set in a post-apocalyptic world in 11,945 AD with Yorha android soldiers, most of whom by the second half of the game get infected by a logic virus in their network, with 2B and 9S as the last few survivors fleeing from their infected comrades and eventually getting separated from each other. 2B alone then gets infected as well and comes across A2, who is a deserter from Yorha and so immune to the logic virus as she cut herself off from Yorha's network servers. At 2B's request, A2 commits a mercy killing on 2B, as 9S then arrives to see 2B being killed by A2 without any context on what is going on, just like Ellie, and then swears revenge on A2. And from there you can then play the game by choosing to go back and forth between 9S and A2, as the former is consumed by his wish to avenge 2B, and the latter mellows down from her initial cult demeanor in becoming a more likable character. That is what Neil Druckmann claimed he was planning to do, and Yoko Taro did it much better in Nier Automata, three years before The Last of Us Part 2 even came out. There are other aspects in what Nier Automata did better than The Last of Us Part 2, but I'll bring it back later for another point I need to make. Anyway, that is the basic premise of The Last of Us Part 2. Joel is killed by Abby, Ellie goes after Abby for revenge, and then the game tries to justify Abby's actions later when Ellie catches up to her. I could probably recognize this being a parallel to how Joel and Ellie themselves were seen by David and his cannibal tribe in the fall and winter sections of the first game, but the game itself never makes Abby acknowledge or feel responsible for the deaths of her friends being because she killed Joel and left Ellie along with Joel's brother Tommy alive to seek revenge against her. No! Instead she goes all You killed my friends. We let you both live. And you wasted it! You killed my friends. You invited us here. We let you both live. Without explaining it. And you wasted it! And at no point is she told or made to realize that she and her friends practically invited Ellie and Tommy over to try to get back at them. That is how Neil Druckmann could have made the players empathize with Abby. Have her acknowledge that she fucked up. As for some side characters that The Last of Us Part 2 then had to support Ellie and Abby as AI companions in their story campaigns, Ellie was aided by Dina and Jesse, with Joel also being present with her in flashback sequences, while Abby had Manny, 
this pregnant woman who was probably trying to abort her unborn child and everyone was letting her, and these two defectors from an enemy faction. Dina and Jesse in Ellie's story were written to be a broken up couple, where Dina left Jesse to be with Ellie, because the first games left behind DLC first hinted at Ellie being bi-curious, before this game locked her into being a lesbian, and Dina is also revealed to be pregnant to Jesse during Ellie's campaign. Jesse then replaces Dina as Ellie's AI companion when her pregnancy puts Dina out of the field work, but ultimately Jesse does not influence the story much from there, and he is killed off rather quick when Ellie's campaign comes to a close. I should probably say something about Tommy, aka Joel's brother too. In the lead up to Abby killing Joel, Tommy gives out his and Joel's names to Abby first when they meet her while fleeing from the infected enemies, and end up in a locked room with Abby's friends. Because the story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story, Joel and Tommy decide to drop their defenses in the company of complete strangers by giving away everything they shouldn't, such as their names and the location of their home of Jackson, Wyoming, that latter of which was hit harder to be a secret location not to be told to outsiders at all in the HBO Max show, where when Joel and Ellie made their way over there and Tommy had to explain to Joel why he had never called back to tell his brother he was still alive, was an another example on why Joel and Tommy should not have been this causal when surrounded by a group of strangers. That fuck up is used to justify how Tommy eventually leaves after Abby and her group in Seattle first, with it being the official reason why Tommy's wife Maria then sends Ellie and Dina to just bring him back home. After that, Tom is then pretty much an unseen force witnessed in passing and from the distance by Ellie, and Abby once comes across him as an enemy encounter. Or in other words, Tommy is used as an another plot device. Then on Abby's side we have Manny, who spat on Joel's corpse and then Tommy killed him anticlimactically with a distant headshot. Before that, however, Manny along with Abby was totally okay with letting this pregnant woman accompany them on a field mission for their faction. Yo. There! Fucking there! The edge of that climb up there. Yeah. Anything? What? Um, it basically just pushed her stomach here. The, that... How would the baby stay intact when that happens? Okay. This male character is so a very broken character, because in a post-apocalyptic world like this, pregnant women and children should be protected as a valuable resource to secure a future generation to carry on the survival of the human race. The father of her child, aka Owen, is also nothing to write home about, outside of him having known Abby and her father, more about that guy later, and Owen also made himself a home away from work, where Abby can visit him for something where I had to turn the game's source off from OBS when I was streaming it. AKA that so bad sex scene that I heard it apparently became a meme, or so I have heard, and not bothered to look up any examples of it. They then there are these two from a third party enemy faction, Yara and Lev, who were created only to be morality pets to make Abby look better after she killed Joel. Their story has some other aspects thrown in there too, such as how Lev is a female to male transgender person with Yara being his secret keeper, and so they have defected out of a very religious enemy faction, came across Abby while on the run, and fought by her side to survive, until Abby decided to make helping them become the distraction she needed to forget about killing Joel. Not to mention, Abby trying to help them then causes her to turn on her own people when caught by them with Lev and Yara. And instead of explaining that they are defectors who could join Abby's faction, the situation is then made to escalate into a combat and stealth situation, where Abby has to fight her former friends and allies to survive and protect Lev. Yeah. Yara died after the game also spent hours in trying to keep her alive, and made the player go on a long quest to get medical equipment, to make sure she got the needed medical attention to make her stay alive at the cost of her left hand. Like I said, morality to pets. 
And before we reach the convergence point of both Ellis and Abby's campaigns, let's talk about Abby's father, Gerry. I refuse to believe him to have been the only doctor in the world who could have made a cure or a vaccine to Ellie's immunity, and probably didn't have the Firefly's drive of wanting to kill Ellie without asking her consent. First of all, because The Last of Us is only shown to be set in the United States, and we do not know if there are other still as qualified doctors in the other countries surviving through the Cordyceps virus. Meaning that there could be other medical professionals who could do a better job at creating a cure working with Ellie's immunity than just Jerry. And second of all, that idiot lacked the medical knowledge where you need to have a living patient to take a biopsy out of, and in case the biopsy is a poor sample, then you still need to keep your patient alive so you can get an another biopsy. Meaning that even if Ellie would have had to be given a life-threatening surgery, they should not have rushed into it as quickly as possible, and the way how he is introduced by rescuing a zebra with Abby comes across as emotional manipulation done too late. And so, most of the troubles the game story had could have been fixed if the story was edited to make Abby's and Jerry's earliest chronological scene with the zebra happen earlier into the game before she killed Joel. People could have reacted to this game so somewhat better if Neil Druckmann decided to use tension like Alfred Hitchcock instead of the overused shocking plot twist method like M. Night Shyamalan. And that brings us to the convergence point at the end of Ellis and Abby's campaigns, which I am again going to compare to Nier Automata. In Ellie's case, it cuts to black when Abby storms into Ellie's holdout and forces us to then play through Abby's campaign with the story being put on a hold. Again in Nier Automata, this aspect was done better by making the player go back and forth between 9S and A2, and only forcing you to play as other one if you had made it up to a certain point with just one of them. So, after we have spent the next nine and a half hours, in my case, playing Abby's campaign to reach this same point again, we then have to play as Abby in a boss encounter against Ellie, similarly as how Ellie had to fight David in a stealth encounter fight in the first game. Except that as Ellie is the armed one, and Abby is unarmed, I can understand how Abby wouldn't say anything here to Ellie as she is trying to sneak up to her, but Ellie should have been instead given dialogue here in explaining why she came after Abby and not realizing that Mel was pregnant until after the fact, similar to how A2 tried to explain why she killed 2B and Operator 210 who was also infected with the logic virus, to 9S when they met each other again in Gordon. Box. That could have helped Abby realize that killing Joel got her consequences that have now come back to haunt her, and influence her choice in letting Ellie, Dina and Tommy walk away after the fight sequence is over. Just having Lev ask Abby not to kill Dina in a gleeful retribution, and not doing it just for him, makes Abby come across as a worse person than the game probably intended. Especially when Ellie was previously shown repulsed and disgusted in learning that she had killed the pregnant Mel. It is this kind of lack in communication that could have then avoided Tommy and Ellie coming after Abby and her friends in the first place, if they had been left with a damn note explaining who they were and why they killed Joel, while also warning them not to come after them because they have a literal army behind them back home. And now let's get to the last two hours of the game. After Abby left Ellie, Tommy and Dina to lick their wounds, and left to parts unknown with Lev, the game then time jumps to a point where Dina has already given birth to Jesse's son, and they are living in a farmhouse with Ellie. Here the game again tries to lull the player into a sense of security that is the cool time period after the third act climax. That one of which absence I complained about in my Gotham by Gaslight video, 
but that is then thrown out the window when Ellie is shown to still be suffering from a post-traumatic stress disorder without having a psychiatrist helping her to get through it. And then Tommy comes to visit Ellie after learning that he has come across the same merchant as Abby has. In so knowing what direction she is going, Tommy urges Ellie to leave her perfect life with Dina and Jesse's son to go hunt Abby down. Against Dina's wishes, Ellie eventually leaves and again, this whole ending could have been avoided if the first Abby B as Ellie fight could have had dialogue in it. Long story short, we play as Abby one more time when she and Lev are caught by Fat, Geralt and the final enemy faction in Santa Barbara. When Ellie then fights her way there through the infected enemies and human enemies, we then reach that point where I'm going to compare this game to a few other games that did it better. First for context, after releasing these ungrateful prisoners from their final enemy faction cells, Ellie finds Abby tied to a stake at the beach and releases her from it along with Lev, and all three of them leave for the boats at the shore. And here the game forces the player into a final boss fight against Abby as Ellie. And if this was initially shown as a scene in the HBO Max show's final episode, I would be probably somewhat more okay with it. But because this is a video game, I'm going to compare it to those other video games that handled an ending like this better, at least from my perspective and yours can differ. Now, let's first compare this to Nier Automata with 9S as Ellie and A2 as Abby. At the end of Automata, 9S and A2 confront each other again on top of a cannon tower, where they first do that thing Ellie and Abby never did, aka talk, with A2 properly explaining why she killed Chobi and how she has come to mourn her passing, while 9S by this point has been driven insane by everything he has done after witnessing Chobi's death, and thanks to also having been infected by the same logic virus as Chobi, he is now too far gone. Their near automata then gave the player a choice in either playing the game's final boss fight as 9S against A2 or as A2 against 9S. Both outcomes then lead to two different bittersweet endings, and let me remind you again, Nier Automata came out in 2017, three whole years before The Last of Us Part 2. Both outcomes were needed to unlock the final ending to Automata, but The Last of Us Part 2 could have benefited from this by asking the players if they had come to empathize with Abby, as Neil Druckmann claims to have originally intended. Ended. If we had come to empathize with Abby, then have Ellie let her and Lev leave to get a better ending, and if not, then have us fight against Abby as Ellie and reach this default ending that the game has as the bad ending. Here is another comparison to another video game with a similar mechanic. If the game were to force us to fight Abby anyway, that could be influenced by an unseen in-game mechanic based on how many people we killed in reaching this point. See, while I was writing this script, I came across this two years old challenge video where Epic Cakes Gaming tried to play through the game on grounded difficulty to see how many of the game's human enemy kills were forced and which ones were avoidable. In the end, Epic Cakes Gaming's final kill count was just 6, and if that is the lowest kill count The Last of Us Part 2 can have, then by applying the in-game morality system of Dishonored and the Metro series, the amount of people killed by Ellie could have been made to influence Ellie's bloodlust to kill Abby, and the higher it was could have led to Ellie's default actions here in the final game. But if it was lower, and the players had so played up to this point by keeping Ellie more focused on not being a mindless murderer, then Ellie would not have been as too far gone as 9S was at the end of Automata, and let Abby go as Neil Druckmann wanted. My third and final comparison is then at the end of Ghost of Tsushima. 
which pretty much understood this philosophy in asking the player how their experience with the game has come to make them believe in it. Long story short to those people who have not played Ghost of Tsushima, there you play as a samurai who is forced to take up the more dishonorable methods of the ninja to combat a Mongol invasion, which then causes the main character to have an eventual falling out with his uncle. In the third act, the main character has become a shinobi, and in meeting up with his uncle one final time, he tells us that our actions have caused the Shogun to see us as a traitor to be killed, and we then need to fight against our uncle, the man who raised us to the death. After winning the final duel against him, the player is then given the choice in either giving him an honorable samurai death, or leave him alive in finally abandoning the way of the samurai, and embracing our role as the ghost of Tsushima. That is what Neil Druckmann claimed that he wanted the players to do in empathizing with Abby by the end of the game, and Ghost of Tsushima, which came out at the same time as The Last of Us Part 2, understood this aspect in executing it better. Which is a real shame, because from a technical standpoint and gameplay-wise, the Last of Us Part 2 was an amazingly well-made game, and if the story was handled better with the gameplay being integrated to work with it, it could be remembered as favorably as the first one was by more people, and the HBO Max show wouldn't be seen as a take-two rewrite of the story. But no. Instead, Ellie gets a flashback about her last conversation with Joel, and based on that for some reason, decides to leave Abby alive before returning to that homestead she had with Dina and Jesse's baby, who have both left the house empty for Ellie to fight. Oh, for fuck's sake, I completely forgot about the flashbacks and Ellie's parent-child relationship with Joel. Okay, since this video is already as long as my near videos, I'll try to keep this last part cohesive. For Ellie, there are about four flashbacks revolving around Joel, and her eventually learning what happened at the end of the first game. She then reacts to it as the game wanted her to react in believing that Fireflies, as complete fuck-ups, could have saved the world by sacrificing her on the operating table. Unfortunately, both Ellie and Joel are unable to comprehend the fact that Joel really saved Ellie from those hacks so that someone more qualified than Jerry could have researched her immunity better without killing her. The only downfall that came from that is that Ellie stops talking to Joel for two years, until Joel on one night stops a walking stereotype from insulting Ellie, and she came to talk to him about not fighting her battles for her. That conversation then leads to Joel quoting this version of Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm tired, Tails. This life I've built for myself? It's all so tiresome. I made so many choices when I was young and foolish. I wish I could go back and do it all again. And then Ellie decides that they could start trying to rebuild their relationship. And of course the flashback took place the day before Abby killed Joel. The other flashbacks with Ellie were then used to establish that she can swim now while getting a birthday surprise from Joel. Then there was a sniper tutorial that doesn't matter, as Ellie never used a sniper during the main game, and I learned that we can die in flashbacks. Interesting question. Can I die in a flashback? I can die in a flashback. And Abby's flashbacks don't matter outside of the first scene she had with her dad, which again should have been at the opening of the game in leading up to Joel telling Tommy about it from his point of view. In the end, I don't think I can look at The Last of Us Part 2 in any other way than with disappointment. The gameplay and graphics are what I can praise as the game's greatest achievements, but when I have seen the story's premise done much better in other video games, the game's quality ends up taking a nosedive that walks a very fine line between the story moving the characters and the characters moving the story. In walking away from it and looking into the future, all I can wonder now is how the HBO Max show is eventually going to retell slash rewrite this game's story similarly as it did with season 1 and what aspects of it are going to get the Bill and Frank treatment.
This part of the video is written after I managed to get everything that came before it edited. Because of this different kind of format in doing an actual video game review like video, I wanted to experience editing it first to know if it will be worth going through it all over again with other games. The Last of Us Part 2 on itself was that big of a game that I had so much to say about it that I truly felt the pressure of making it the harder way than my previous video game recap reviews. And then the game's story was told non-linearly, so an average retelling would have been too much to work with. But for a smaller game like Sonic Adventure 2, I think this format could be more manageable. Also, I wanted to talk briefly about some new things that might come to mind for me about The Last of Us Part 2 while I edited the video, but now as I am in writing this part, I think I have said everything worth saying already. But that is what the comment section is for. So, write down whatever I could have also focused on along with what you agreed or disagreed with me. That kind of discourse is always welcome, and if The Last of Us Part 2 did have multiple endings, then we could have discussions on which ending was the canonical one, similar to the debates over if Joel did or didn't do the right thing at the end of the first game. The next video projects I'm planning to focus on next are that delayed comic to adaptation comparison review on Superman vs the Elite, reviewing Sonic Adventure 2, and part 3 of my Near Replicant review series. While you wait for those, remember to like this video, comment your thoughts about this video down below, share the video for more people to see, and subscribe for those following videos. Also, ding the bell for when I will be doing gameplay streams between my video game script writing sessions for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.